all of you to, uh, to show up to listen to uh, oh, Mr. Mr. Farage. Maybe it's a tough day, too many, too many reviews, but that shouldn't diminish the content. Yeah. Um, Farage is, a, is an unusual character. I think if there, if there are a number of interesting architects, there are relatively few Farages, uh, <laughs> for better and for worse. Uh, I think Tom has a very unique relationship uh, with the architecture discussion in Los Angeles, which must have run 15, 20 years, uh, something, something like that. He was, Tom was trained as an architect, as a lot of you know, was, was a student of Cyark a number of years ago. Uh, and, and Doing something which is, I think, quite extraordinary to the fabrication, the steel fabrication process, which is a conceptual capacity to work and to think and to analyze and to understand uh, in concert with the architects that he's sharing projects with. And sharing is, is probably the, the operable word it's funny because I, I think in some ways, although Tom has been associated with a number of unusual projects in the city, fabrications, steel work, um, he's, and, and, and with what at one point was called the avant-garde in Los Angeles, it seems pretty clear that, that in many ways he's actually a very traditional guy. Uh, and although when you get to the end of a project, looks like something which is quite extraordinary, unprecedented, not seen too frequently. It actually, in almost every case, is a product of a handmade process. And a lot of that process relates to discussions which go on. I've had a number with Tom and, and, and as have other Los Angeles architects, where essentially you're drawing on the wall. So the project comes to be what it is, less for what it is conceptually, although there's always a driving idea, and more in terms of this angle, and this Z, and this bolt, and this well. And uh, for architecture students, and there aren't dozens in the room, what's, what's useful about that process has very much to do with understanding how pieces of steel go together or how they might otherwise go together. In other words, you can do this, and you can do that, and you might do this, and you might do that. All of the, all of the options. And, and I think Tom has a very interesting kind of versatility and flexibility and adaptability. At the same time, if, if, if we go into a project and we're doing something with Tom, and I think, I think this is what makes the project so productive and so fruitful, there are probably certain things, if it's, if it's me or if it's me personally, we have to do this. There are certain things you won't let go that you'll kill for, otherwise the project is good. There are probably other things that he'll kill for and won't let go, otherwise the project is gone. So there's a certain tension between the characters who won't let go. And somewhere in the middle, is where a lot of these, I won't let go, no, you won't let go, no, I gotta let go a little bit, you gotta let go a little bit. And I think in the process of working through that tension, uh, as, as far as I can see, you continue to learn about what you thought you already knew all about. So I think, I think working with Farage is, is really in a very traditional Sire sense, a continuing, a continuing education, not only in a technical way, but in an emotional, <laughs> in an emotional way too. And even that, I think, I mean, he, he's, he's certainly not passive, he's very engaged, he's very committed, uh, he's committed to the content of work and the ideas of the work, and, and, and all of those qualities are, are quite extraordinary. There are, there are comments that are probably made a little bit too loosely about associations with 
people who built like Scarpa. And, and uh, I think people tend to say those things because, because associations like that are supposed to convey a particular sort of credibility to the work. I think in the end, he is who he is. And he's done and continues to do what he does. And, and clearly, he's, a, he's a, a very unique, unusual voice in the world of design, engineering, fabrication, and implementation, and construction in Los Angeles, in America, and given the number of things that we've all worked on together around the world. So uh, say hello to Signore Tom Farage. So this hidden scene uh, took a certain amount of uh, 
flexibility and uh, uniqueness to anything we make. It, it, it gives that, that, that same how do you do it, how do you create this piece? Uh, and um, that's the magic of welder. In that workshop, every day people would walk by and they would think we were actually part of SciR, and many uh, uh, professors and students would stop by, and Floyd would stop by, and we started talking about putting bases together. I'll never forget how we had an exhibit, and we just sat around and composed pieces of metal and to see how we would uh, put bases together. I remember I had a great passion for building. I think that also stemmed out of uh, the, the knack for SciArc and the excitement for people with such talent. This is one piece that shows an example of how you can weld two pieces together. Is it a split I-beam or is it two channels put together? And um, certain objects that we've created over the years sort of become pivotal points or where, where enlightened pieces for me, where they've taught me something and how that translates into the next piece. I believe in, in changing scales and working being a jeweler at one point allowed me to test ideas, and then as, as an architect, you uh, have a better understanding when you build a large. Stamping and curling and bending and these um, ways of manipulating metal uh, uh, started to find their own language. For instance, in the base on the right, I'm starting small. You can see how once you heat metal up, you start to understand the temper marks, the coloring. These things, um, I asked myself, I told myself, is it okay what I'm doing? Uh, will five years of doing this allow me to be a better architect? Well, working with these people, uh, these talented architects, did they teach me as I'm helping them? And I felt that it was okay to be a craftsman after five years. I would then become back and I would become an architect again, go back and work in architecture firm. Well, that five years has turned into 20 years, 23 years, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that it probably, hopefully, if it is, I do want to be an architect someday. But I, I want to put them both together, right? I want to put where there's, there is the metal shop, there is the architecture, and it all merges together. And that's the way I set up my architecture in office. Teaching also allows you and the students who are bringing ideas and it allows me to also go to the next step as well. For instance, the, uh, these rings, for instance, are just flat part of roll, but when you lay it down and you fold them up, they create the wall or the, the candles, or the tube empty one you can see here. You can see uh, in the background, we always try to merge the architecture office with the manufacturing. Sculpting came into play, and I always go back to this, these few classes I took at Santa Monica City College. Uh, I learned how to sculpt, then you learn how to make molds. Then you learn how to cast the molds. Then you realize you can cast them in many different materials, from glass to metal and, and plastics, etc. Every time I learn a technique, it seems to have help all the other techniques and all the other tools that I have in the shop. Um, and when I presented with a problem from an architect, from a designer, uh, all these images and visualizations go through my head to see how we can make what the architect is talking about. Uh, I guess my role is that has been to help visualize what they're trying to, to help them create their vision. And in many ways, to be a participant has always been fine for me. I think I get more out of it than they do in many ways. We'll show you. This is a project we did with Frank Israel years ago. Wonderful working with Frank. Uh, it was a Frank Gehry building and uh, I tend to work best when, when somebody <clears throat> talks to me and tells me, you know, what do you think? What are your ideas? This is what I'm visualizing. You go off and draw it, come back, and then we'll discuss it. And these series of fireplaces for Bert Mormon um, allowed me to explore things uh, like initially it was many years ago. Uh, 
uh, a weight counterweight system, for instance, which had 2,000 pounds of lead, 2,000 pounds of glass, and a weight counterweight. You learn certain things about inertia when you're doing that kind of stuff, right? And you understand how uh, these objects work over time, the schedule of assembly, uh, how they attach to the real building, how the load is translated down, how you work with engineers and architects, and the fabrication all merges together. Um, this was our fireplace, which had the chain metal and glass. And how we have a language of metal, which is uh, angles and tubes and bars and channels, and that language. I typically try to manipulate that language so we're not building custom pieces, but we're taking standard architectural objects and, and layering it to create unusual pieces. Funny, I've written this to say that every time I do that. Uh, telescoping is always a great, uh, for me, was uh, a way to deal with it too. But you'll see um, over here a series of projects how we dealt with. Uh, Telescoping. Telescoping where it becomes a pivotal piece, it becomes an object, and it also allows uh, uh, to solve certain problems. Uh, this is a piece by Michael Rotundi, a couple pieces of his uh, experiment. I kind of call this uh, influence of contrivances because a lot of these things are ideas, experiments, and quite often they, they don't really work out. You know? But, but it allows us to go to the next step on it. Uh, this is with Wolf Green. We did a jewelry box, a uh, music box for Wolf. Wolf, uh, one thing that I realize is um, it's about really loving your work, you know, and, and being passionate about it. And I tend to uh, work better with architects that, that really are passionate about their work. I can feel it, you know, in this case, Wolf drew drawings of it and then he went to Mexico and came back with a tattoo with a sketch on his back and uh, he made these objects and he put some in his house and uh, it, it, it is it, the passion and the and the, the stick to activity as you might say uh, carries you through uh, these investigations of the experiments. This is one of our first architectural projects we did for Smashbox Studios. And um, we walked across the street one day. I was behind Eric's office, sandwiched at that point between Eric and Wolf. And I met Dean Factor, and he asked me to do a series of projects. We did about eight all together. But at that point, we started bringing in the implements. We started not only designing the building, but we started bringing the furniture, the tables, the artwork throughout. He also decided to uh, start a cosmetics company called Smashbox Studios and we designed the cosmetics cases, the furniture, the women, the metals, the different things. Uh, and that allowed us to, uh, at the same time I was doing a bunch of plexiglass for Eric. So they're teaching me and I'm helping them. And, I, and then in turn I'm able to take some of those ideas and simulate them into uh, the, the, the build talk. This was a cosmetics uh, uh, holder. And what we tried to do here is we tried to take metal and spin it and then reverse the spin. Uh, and, and there's something about drawing something and, and then thinking you know how it's going to go together and then walking up to the tool that's actually going to make it and look at the material and try to put the material in the tool. And then you realize the tool starts to teach you. And, and once you uh, start to spin something, you start to realize how you can do it a better, a better way. Quite often, we will make something and uh, toss it because we right away realize a better way to make something. Clients don't know that we're throwing the work away and starting over, but we get off on the wrong foot quite often. This, this taught us how when you take a disc of metal and you spin it, you spin it into a form and you want to layer it, there's a whole series of uh, other techniques that have to go through. Whether you cut the holes first and spin it, or you spin it and cut the holes, uh, how you want to place it. So the way we, we, we one of the surprises of this piece was we put some lead in it and it would, it would lean off center, and that would allow the an angle, and it would spin in a certain way. And 
we ended up putting these on a lot of the earlier cases for dealing with these cosmetics. We worked on a few movies. This was a table we did for Batman, uh, the movie. It was a series of two, Ben Plate, Channel, and Borrow. This was a series of quick furniture for Total Recall, another movie we worked on. The Villain's Chair. Uh, Birdcage, the movie, we did a series of stamped and uh, pressed uh, uh, demolition man table, which on this table, <coughs> what I learned is, is again, the, the technique of welding, where if you want a piece of metal or, or something to roll into a plate, but it doesn't work that way, you can work in the reverse. You can take the tube, put it on a piece of plate, weld it, the seam disappears, and it gives the illusion that the plate rolled off of the material. We've done a series of sculpture using water. This one um, was in the courthouse. Sometimes some characters will come in. And, uh, uh, and this was a, a guy named Noah Bushnell, who actually uh, was the founder of uh, Art of Atari. He was the creator of the video game. And he, uh, one of the spin off companies of his company, Atari, was Mac. He wanted a computer design <coughs> for a tabletop. We designed a triangle computer where we inserted a small Macintosh and he came back and designed his own motherboard. And it was right when we got the CNC machine and we cut out a series of stainless steel pl plates and, and rolled them and bent them and created, um, you can see much the, the, the shelf in the background, we created a series of, uh, a series of uh, computers for his new Restaurants. Our restaurants were um, uh, self-serving restaurants. You sit down, and he wanted to create a social device. And the social device was the touch screens, you could touch screens, monitor, you create your own food, you order your own food. He simply had runners come to us. So this was the concept, his vision that he gave us: how he wanted these saddles to fit on the table. And we made them and uh, built about three or four stores. Uh, George Yu, I've worked with George Yu many years. Uh, George is a very nice guy. Sorry to see him go. Uh, he uh, would uh, sit down and, and, and sketch, and again, he, he was one that would allow me to draw as well. Uh, certain architects work different ways. When I work in Eric's office, everything comes drawn right down to the nut and bolt, to the screw, and you sort of follow directions, and you sketch on top of his drawings. Other architects, allow us to draw, or they'll give us the small architectural drawings. In Tom's case, uh, the, there's always the, the sketch, the lunch, and then I go off and draw. Um, this was a, a series of two roll two verticals with a series of brackets that had to connect to his form plexiglass and the cast resin. Uh, this was a tabletop. Uh, for one of Oprah Winfrey's offices. Um, the series of angles, when you don't see these seams, again, this, this, it's seamless once you weld, and it had a high polish, and then on the inside, you painted it a fire and red. Uh, Patrick Tyle, I worked with early on uh, with the Tom Main Amorphosis on the SHR Conceptual Management job. Patrick's been a, a lot of fun to work with. He comes up with some crazy ideas. And, seems to have the clients that can pull them off. This is one of those pieces we did in a park. This is a house we uh, built a whole series of open ones, the doors, the tables, the walls, the interior, the pond, and the fireplace. This was a piece we just finished for Patrick, which was, um, uh, you can see the top right, the top left, we had a, a Rusted piece. This was an earlier idea that I had about inserting lights inside the walls, and, and uh, Patrick went to the next level on it. You can see how we made them out of aluminum, and we inserted them on the remote steel studs. And uh, we just finished this job a few months ago. It was a series of aluminum cut, plasma cut panels under the wall with about 150 light fixtures on the other side. 
these what was on LED and it was too difficult. Uh, later, after the, John Portick and Gary and I worked all together when we were out of school, uh, John got a commission from Bob Graham and John B. Houston's home. And he will be able to get a series of things for him. One was the front door of Silver Bonds, and uh, you can see us loading in the, uh, the stone on top of the interior. Uh, there was a bowl of the door, of course, because it was right off the right on Woodward, I think. And uh, this was the, the Going back to telescoping, um, we were presented by the project on Richard Meyer uh, job for the old reason. And the, uh, the idea was to create a very, very tight spiral stairway, especially on the inside of the spiral. Uh, all the other people bidding, a few people bidding against us, were saying it couldn't be done simply because you can't roll a flat bar tube into the spiral that tight. We thought of a way to work in the negative where we would take two tubes and telescope them, one and another with two inch space between them. And once we would tap them together, we would cut out the inner tube and cut out the outer tube, creating this ribbon. Uh, something like this uh, was a, you know, sort of an enlightenment for me. I, I realized that all the other things I could do once I learned that technique again, the material, once I was, you know, uh, uh, once the material, once the tube is in front of me and you have to find a way to make it, uh, we try different things and this was actually one of those pivotal pieces that actually turned out pretty good. We had to build it completely and lower it in over the house. We also realized something about building something and not, ever, not planning how you're going to get in the building, you know, so <laughs> instead of thinking we were going to walk it in, we ended up having to have a hundred foot crane lowered in over the top. We, we fell a little bit behind and the building kind of caught up on us. Here's the piece when it's done. We painted it white, wrapped it, and actually closed it to the little spiral piece. This was a door. Uh, we did another little John Porter project. This was a door uh, for the Riddell house. Quite often we get these artists that come in, and this was uh, Cherry Martin, who was a gallery, and they brought in an artist and he built a lot of Donald Jeff furniture. He would build Donald Jeff furniture and stand it on top of each other and put his artwork on it. So we went into a production of about a half a year of just building Judd furniture and uh, attaching it. When you look at Donald Jeff's furniture, you, you, you see it as a simple piece, but in order to build something like that, you realize you quickly you have to make your own dies. You have to set up the machine to build that kind of and um, he didn't build it out of silicon bronze, but he did about, uh, I realized what I was a lot of money these pieces would be sold five sets of them for uh, in the six figures. Five sets here. There's another series of pieces we did out of silicon bronze. We would help him with his casting. We would um, uh, send it off for castings. We would send off, but we would do the finishing and fastening. Then we made a series of plates. Uh, those aren't solid plates that it's made of. Those are uh, welded. And here's the next piece. Uh, I thought I showed this. This is a prop. This is a fabrication right now. And again, it's it's a it's a Donald Jeff piece. Or something like a Donald Jeff piece. Where, uh, one of his objects is drool. You know, we call that the drool. Uh, Actually, I, I put a series of, of, of work for Tom May and Eric separate because I feel that you know, that's been the real experiment for me and the real surprise of all this is when I started the metal shop and Tom walked in and he was uh, right out of Harvard, I think, and he uh, had a series of ideas and he said he liked what I did and he wanted me to build something with him. And one of the first things we built was a toy. It was a toy for his son. And um, it was a little destroyer object. And I have to say, uh, this was in 1986, and uh, I, I've never not had a job for Tom in the office. He continually comes in, he pushes it. He uh, has been a real good friend and a good ally. Uh, he, con he constantly, we 
we talk about the machinery, we talk about you know architecture. He's a very uh, uh, I want to say passionate, pushy uh, guy that wants uh, like any passionate architect wants to see this stuff built. And um, we went through a series of uh, pieces, hundreds of pieces, thousands of pieces, really. And um, every piece, uh, it's interesting, you could talk about a small object or, or, or a 50-story building, and you don't know, you know, there's no, there's no difference between the two. Um, with his, with his babies, and, and we really pushed the boundaries. This is early on in Cyrus, in my old shop, and then one interesting thing about the shop, is um, people constantly walk by, well, would walk by the shop and met some unbelievable people. Uh, and they all were very encouraging in those days. And the shop was so small that when, when we get a commission, the material would come in, but we, we couldn't close the doors because we had to build it and we realized we didn't have enough space to house the material or the product. So we started just, we just kept the shop open. Sometimes 24 hours at a time until the project was done and then we did it for This is Saul Golden, who's the lighting designer at Star, and he uh, is quite often come by and tinker and make materials and put me in all these tangents. But one thing Saul always used to tell me is to reach back, you know, and find out where you come from. And uh, in my case, I came from a small farm community out in the desert and, uh, and, and, and try to use that as a basis to build the practice. Quite often, this is the scene of we were doing four politics building stores for Tom at the same time: Cleveland, Las Vegas, Portland, Los Angeles. And again, the objects had to stand outside. Then I realized, it, you know, it, it was I would learn, but also it, we would. It was, it was the first time I ever started to teach, uh, even at a small level, and the students would come over and we would, um, even though I didn't have a class at that point. Uh, there was a lot of helpers. I always had helpers because it was right in the This is us at night building the pieces, a series of objects. The way the object is intended is not really always the most beautiful way to present the object. And these pictures sort of represent some of the pieces we made and some of the things that, we, that I saw. This is the final product. A series of clothing stores. I uh, tried to compose this picture where the, the final product, the angel lamp, was actually uh, juxtaposed to the jigs and the brackets that make it. And that's where I always found the beauty of metal fabrication. Again, not in the final object, but in the process of it. Cast aluminum, perforated metal. Spring steel, he treated chairs, and this was a runway over to the light on the project that we did with Tom. This is Tom's table, called Dino Tom. He moves around, and uh, was his conference table for many years. Uh, he didn't care that people would sit at it, cut their legs, and rip their clothes, uh, but I think that was uh, part of the job. This is uh, my crew when we were starting to build a project uh, called uh, the Walker Art Center. It was one of the first pieces where I actually met the art at, uh, at the Open in Minneapolis. Um, though I met him a couple times, I, don't, I think that was the first time he remembered me. Um, we did a series of this project right here where it was a series of, uh, again, reaching back to those three classes or four classes I told you I took. Uh, this uh, was etched steel. All the pieces were etched. I was presented with five drawings, which were layered on top of each other. One was um, we assigned the lines, which were etched lines and added to lines, and subtracted lines. Some were wood, some were metal. Uh, we had uh, 45 pieces of plate metal to weld them, make it look like they were solid blocks, and we composed this object uh, at the Walker Arts in Minneapolis. It was like 1982. 1982. Uh, Tom again, uh, one of his model bases, which actually pulled out the good section. This brought back in some of the sculpting ideas I had, where Tom had a project at, um, 
NEC Design Center, and he uh, had an idea. You can see, if you can come in with the drawing and sketch a little bit, and then we'll talk about how to build it. And, uh, what I did is I took foam and I sketched the sculpt of the foam into a form, made of plastic fiberglass model. We made 100, 100 of these uh, ceiling objects, which uh, swam all in the same direction. But of course, when we were completely done, he said, something's wrong, we don't have any male and female. So then we went in and cut the female and we added a little object to the male and created a light out of it, and then we had pairs. You can see how the pairs start to merge together. And we took the same idea, I show the sketches because this was the discussion. The sketch was the discussion. We would talk, we would sketch, and I would draw. And um, his one rule is he wanted everything in this conference room to hang from the ceiling. The conference room uh, was for SHR Perceptual Management. They were redesigning the Jaguar. BW uh, so the conference table, the mobile, uh, all up in the ceiling. This is an you know, image of the reflection of the mobile looking through the table. You can see some of the objects, uh, and everything is in suspension. <coughs> model bases for Tom. Tom always puts a huge amount of effort into his models and his presentations. Um, and uh, he's not willing to take, he's willing to take the risk of, of, it, of having to redo. This was a piece for the uh, Olympic Village, which he won the competition. And then once we found something that worked, we used one of the projects. It's a series of stainless steel tubes, stainless steel rods. Uh, some of them were tubes because they had to house electrical. And there was a certain amount of chaos as it came up, but it all came down to four points on the ladder. The couch I cast in the moon. Um, this was something Tom and I did <coughs> where we laminated wood on a loom and we created a series of uh, furniture. And one of the interesting things that came out of this and then was that aluminum bends a certain way, but wood doesn't. But if you laminate the wood to the aluminum, it sort of has, from one view, it looks like a car piece of wood. From the other view, it's a very thin piece of wood. This was another conference table. This is actually his table in New York for his office. It's home. Now, the poles represent candles. Candles come from inside the table and protrude up and, uh, and create the This is a project we built. Uh, you shouldn't be welding in shorts. <laughs> uh, this was a, a model we did for the BNLV uh, for this tower. When I say we did, that means that we, we, we fabricated the metal fabrication and we worked in conjunction with his office. comes to me and says, uh, this is the last piece for the 6th Street residence. If this is the last piece, this is what we're going to do. Uh, but it's never the case. It's, it's, a, it's a never ending experiment with Tom on his house. And um, quite often, life, his wife will say, you know, Tom's like a drunk sailor around you. He comes in, he has another idea, another idea. And uh, you know, you're, you're kind of expensive. And I told him, wait, don't like, yet. He, it's better that he makes his mistakes and so his ideas get tested here while it's small versus, you know, a larger building. And I think that's where uh, our larger construction. Uh, and I think um, maybe that's where I am helpful. Uh, this was a piece where Tom had the idea that he wanted to need a fireplace, but he wanted it to be a garden on the top, and a tertiary on the side, and he can create this whole object in, in, the, in, the, uh, in his backyard. And so we started fabricating in the blonde, and really, and we ended up with uh, this uh, I could probably, you know, Read a book of just the objects that we built in Tom's office, in his house on 6th Street. It's been going on. Again, it was one of the first pieces we ever worked on, and we're still working on it. So it's a, it's a, it's a project that's spanning over 25 years. This is a, a model base that we recently that we did for Tom when he was going after the Union project in New York. And uh, one of the things that are sort of left me 
is that he says that, you know, we, we're, we put a lot of effort into presentations. Matter of fact, he says, uh, you know, we, we, it's like horse race. You know, we have to put all the effort in. We have to go for the best of it. You have to put something in order to win a project like this, you have to assume that you know, if you don't put all the effort, somebody else will take away, take away the prize. Uh, Blythe wasn't very happy that we were going down this route, uh, but at the same time, I think she was happy that they won the competition. This was uh, uh, a model base where the idea is that the, the, the model would lift up uh, and then um, it, would, it would split in half a remote control or a foot guide. Uh, Tom mentioned that uh, when when he lifted it up the first time, one of the trustees asked him, well, what does it look like inside? And then he pressed the other button and the thing split apart. Right? And uh, he got a little bit of and he won the competition. I think the project's almost, almost built. So maybe the, the $8,000 base was worth it, but it's a $300 million. Uh, this is a piece we recently did, which was a, uh, library letter is now in the library shelves in his offices in New York. Uh, this was a, a ladder. Uh, we didn't get very good shots of it. It included two maybe uh, wood. Uh, the challenge on this piece was to create wheels which would actually retract and um, lock into place so you're not on the ladder at the time. As well as making the wood match to the floor. We worked on a project with Tom um, in uh, the Pompidou project in, in Paris. And it was uh, very exciting. We worked with uh, Zayn Sheet Metal, which we had as a We built all the brackets. Uh, one of the exciting things about this was two exhibits. And one was 86 artists from LA giving an exhibit. And the other one was Tom Hain, which was an architect. And I went with my friends, the Ponces. And my Tom Ponce is a big art collector, one of the biggest in the world. And he, uh, we went to this project and he walked through and he, he said something very interesting. He says it, it takes one great architect to show 86 artists their way. And, and something really interesting is about that because if you go into one exhibit, you've had, it wasn't a very well put together exhibit. And there was a lot of competition of space and you know, uh, every artist wanted to be presented in a big way. And it was actually not a very good show according to him. But when he walked into Tom's piece, he loved the fact that it was one contained unit. It was a ramp, you could walk on the ramp, you could look down at everything, everything was very contained. And, and it really, it, it really inspired him. And he, and he uh, we went to dinner with him and Tom later that night. And he told Tom so about it. What I was kind of interested about was six months earlier, Tom said, these artists are going to be eclectic in the other room. I want to put together something very, very similar. I want to contrast what these guys are going to do. And um, so he had the foresight to know what other people would think before the fact. This is a piece we're working on now for Tom. I thought I'd show something that's in progress. Uh, this is um, a, a, a bathroom in a column, is what I call it, or a bathroom fixture. Uh, Tom wants to build a, in his, now his apartment in New York, he has one small little room, but he wants the sink, the shower, the urinal, the medicine cabinet, the light fixtures, everything uh, put inside of a column. Here it is in the shop. I took this picture a few days ago. <clears throat> There's some challenges that go along with that. Plumbing, drainage, supply, electrical, lighting, all comes together. Uh, and uh, glass. And this is uh, all we're going to put We tried something new here. But we actually didn't draw. We sketched, eat sketch, and then I would sketch, and then we would fabricate. Um, <clears throat> It has its challenges going that way because you rebuild a lot, but because we couldn't draw every client supply component, and we couldn't figure out how they would work on the it was more about sculpting than uh, actual fabrication. And this is this guy. I've been uh, next to you. 
three years, uh, and we have built a whole series of different scale projects from models to uh, architectural models. Um, this was a model that we did for the NARA competition. It was made out of stainless steel and mobile steel. And it brought back a lot of my jewelry making techniques. Again, I think by taking those few classes uh, early on in my Sire uh, uh, education allowed me to find a path that was genuine. And I think if anyone finds a genuine, uh, genuine interest and they follow his interests, I think that's where uh, uh, we're very, very real lucky and you kind of find your own identity in architecture. It's quite often people are looking at magazines and sort of popular other people's work or, or, or inspired. But if you, uh, I was told many years ago by someone to respect that if you can find your genuine interest, and, and then that's a better way, it's a better path to a new type of architecture. Um, this, this jewelry making, has, has helped me along the way. Uh, I used it in uh, different scales of projects. This was um, This was uh, we go to auctions quite often. This is a series of doors. We went to an auction and bought a series of doors. And I remember uh, Eric's earlier office was built with doors. We acquired. This was a common stable which uh, was laminated wood doors and steel doors. And the idea was again to take it into the realm of jewelry. And I always thought that metalwork, if, you, if it's prepared right, it has that quality uh, that uh, the jewelry has. And this was one of the pieces that uh, finished very cleanly. Uh, and uh, the colors uh, sort of working together had that quality. The sketches, I mean, I always thought that, you know, it's hard to talk because Eric's sitting right there, but you know, we, uh, we have this, uh, I had this idea in my head that if I showed Tom a tool, and I showed Eric a tool, and I showed Tom how a tool works with a certain material, and I showed Eric how a tool works with a certain material, because I was working with both of them, they both come back to me with these different ideas of how those tools work. And so really, I'm, I'm helping them in some ways reach with their vision, but you know, they're, they're actually teaching me a great deal. They're coming back to me in different ways. I showed Tom how to shear and break works, and then I, I showed Eric. And Eric got all excited and started drawing sketches on my door, you know. He told me, okay, every night I'll come in, you'll leave it late at night, I come in early in the morning, I'll just draw on your door, and remember, and I'll extrude it back 24 inches, and, uh, and, and, and build it, and we'll see what it looks like the next day. We call this the old fold series, because um, he would, uh, I wish I would have saved my door, actually, because it was a pretty interesting door after about a month or two. But what we, he would do is he would draw how a chair would go into a table, how it would go into a light fixture, how it would come back down. And the rule was is I would bend those sections out of steel. Steel would come four foot by eight foot, so we cut it at 24 inches down the long way, and we would try to fold it up and bend it up. And we did a whole series of experiments um, like that as well. This was a disc that we had laying around the shop that we caught Eric's eye. And he just started sketching on it. He's like, just bit it here, bit it there, we're going to turn it into a bench. And um, there was a, a, an amazing freedom that came out of it. And, uh, and the objects in the are just as well as they were. This was uh, one of the first larger exhibits we did for Eric. It was at the Wexner Art Center. And it was also in conjunction with the San Francisco Home, New York Home, a series of fabrication projects. They would invite uh, architects to uh, uh, come in and create objects. Uh, Eric, uh, this was a Peter Eisenman building, and Eric uh, wrapped these rhythm, ribbons around it. And, uh, I, did, I had no idea that this thing was going to go together. And I have to say that, that both Tom and Eric have always thought I could build more than I could build, that I could do more than I could do. It was hard for me to tell them no. It's almost impossible to tell them no. So we, uh, we, uh, we, we do it, and I'm, you know, I'm very proud that I, I can't believe it, you know, something, that we do some of these things and I stay alive. Uh, this, this piece, uh, uh, now the piece we're doing in the gallery is another challenge, and uh, it's sort of an offshoot of these. This one. Uh, 
What's a shame is, is after a piece like this is completed, uh, they just take it down and toss it. And I really didn't want to see this thing go, so I have a storage house on my home someday. We'll put it back up, maybe right here. Sometimes, you know, I, I think when, 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 when they do put the garage factor into the project, uh, when, when things are being designed, they, they actually design something in. Um, because it carries on the conversation. I think part of the conversation is that you know, it's lasting so many years that, you know, uh, it, it, uh, it starts to have its own language. This is a bridge that we built up there. A bridge to nowhere and a water fountain that falls to the water that drops the water on you if you are on the bridge. Tables. Uh, again, experiments, uh, implements. Uh, we were do uh, Eric was designing a project, the Westgate residence, and I thought how interesting it would be if the water pipe would come out of the wall and turn into a clock and go back in the wall. And so after a, a, a sandwich of JJ's, we uh, started figuring out how we were going to make a water, water pipe clock. There was an exhibit in New York, which was Angels and Franciscans, and a, uh, a series of architects were invited, Los Angeles and San Francisco architects. And um, Eric uh, was building an amazing model of a building called the Arnott Residence. It was supposed to be built. I don't think it ever did it. Uh, he, uh, one summer, when I was teaching a class, he said, uh, you know, we've got to do this in the summertime to try to build a wall over this thing. And then we built both of them, the Arnold Mall and this one. This one became especially a challenge because of the complexity of it. We had a plasma cut, topography, and we focus. But one thing that came out of it was, again, the hidden, the hidden scene where when you look at the piece and it's done, it looks like you, you took a ball and you carved it away, but actually we built it from the inside out. And the last piece was a spun bowl that actually went out of the face. And when um, we welded the last weld on it, any indication of how it was made disappeared. And uh, at the same time, Tom asked me, you know, to, to help him fix up some old objects that he was making. And then I got a call from Frank Israel, and he asked me to make some titanium drawings for him. And we did a whole series of titanium drawings. And then when I arrived at the gallery in, in uh, New York, everybody was standing around this. Frank was pacing outside, telling me how could you do it. And Tom was telling me, you stole one aesthetic. I thought, man, how did I get the web of these three guys? <laughs> And uh, I was very proud of this piece, and uh, it still stands at the front door of Eric's office. Uh, this was a table that we did um, for the Golden Group for Eric. The disc that was taken out of the middle, you saw on the bench earlier on. Um, this is when we first received the bought the, the, uh, the, the milling machine. See, one of our first ideas was to, to pin this piece together, the top and bottom piece, with stainless steel pins, which were actually milled off center in the radius. Uh, and, um, and what we had to do, we learned a lot about press fitting in those days. If you drill a one inch hole and you have a one inch stud, it will actually go fit the hole. That's what we had to do a little research and develop them. What we did is we heated up the metal so it would expand the hole. We didn't insert the pin and then it would shrink around the pin. And that's how it was out of the process.
attach two tubes together, two round tubes. Well, we came up with smashing the tube, where you smash it is where you put it together. I think that detail stuck because now you can look at um, Peter Sullivan and you have the two tubes in the building, right, smashed together. So it sort of validates the idea that, that you know, working small, testing the idea is okay. Helps you uh, when you're making decisions on larger objects. We also put aluminum or steel rails together, put cast in the rubber, and those became the rubber seats. It moves a little bit. This is a project we did for Tom, a series of objects for a Westgate house, the stairway that unspiral as you came down. Uh, the gate, the aluminum gate that wouldn't open at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, but in the morning it would open. There was a lot about expansion in those days. The client would call me and say, the gates aren't open, you know, show up the next morning and say, oh, it's fine. <laughs> and the fireplace that went through the roof. Uh, one, one thing about this fireplace is that it was another shot. Right here. Um, we were presented with a steel, which, which is burnt. When, when you buy hot oil steel, it comes with burn marks on the edge. So we talked about book matching the, the, the steel. And it actually made a pretty interesting pattern. And taught me how you would work with what you have. Again, how you can visualize that work. Now, how what does all this mean? You go through many years of doing this, and then you have a chance of building your own piece of architecture or coming up with a project. Uh, we, had, we had built a few pieces of architecture with Team Factor and a couple other little film studios around town. And one day, uh, Team came over and grabbed me and I was welding, and he said, "You know, one of my friends came from New York." Stavros Burgos, he has uh, most of his largest maker of music videos in the country, if not the world. And he, he likes what you did at, at Smashbox. He liked you to build his new studios, and actually, he wants to move here uh, in Port City. He's going to move right down the street. He bought this building, and he wants to meet you. And I said, okay, well, let me go get dressed up and cleaned up, and I'm going to move He says, if you do, we won't get the job. He says, you have to go exactly the way you are. It was one of my first. Uh,
to you know. And um, we uh, had a series of rooms, which we wanted every room to have a corner window, because the rooms were very small. And so we tried to use the form next to it to gain more space. So it was all about grabbing space, grabbing views, so people wouldn't feel claustrophobic in these conference rooms. It was about how you take a producer, a director, and a crew, and create a commercial, or create a music video. And they wanted to have 12 of you at the same time. Everything was steel construction. And again, the process is really a uh, more interesting than the final project. Uh, and it really allowed me to use some of the ideas that we had worked out over the years. You can see here with the steel frame for the door. Um, we had a conference room which hung with stainless steel rods. So the rods had to be tensioned up. And where all the structure of that conference room is underground, we did great room. Uh, the contractor forgot to order the windows, and so you learned something about you know, 16 week lead times, right? So we ended up building all the windows. It was almost like the way they build aircraft. You bring them, you build the aircraft around the manufacturing shop. Since we were one block away, we ended up building those in this building. Uh, we brought in some 75,000 pounds to the plates and we uh, put them vertically with no indication of structure. structure. And we uh, lined them up with the center line of the road. So as you're driving out to the building, you actually don't see the plates that are perpendicular to you. You focus on the one that's 40 feet away and um, it grows between the two. And when you have to turn the corner, you realize the, you know, the other plate. There are surprises that come out all the time. When we were lifting the steel, pieces were flaking up at the weak points, and those were the points that actually became rusted, creating that noise. So then, I kind of ask myself what's the next step, is what, what am I doing here, you know, am I off, is what I'm doing obsolete? The tools are obsolete, anyways. The people that taught me how to work these tools have passed on. Uh, they say manufacturing is gone. You can't buy the material that you want to help them with the uh, So I have to ask myself what's the next step. I remember when uh, the last year we had me was the director of Cyber. He asked the question, you know, is architect, does the architect of the future have to be an architect and something else? I can explain how, what and mean. And at that point, we were in a pretty bad recession. Right? And so I asked it again, as an architect, can they survive as being an architect? Is it an really architect again? And um, I'm asking myself what the next step is. You know, step is obviously people can't afford a lot of this stuff by middle. It's too time consuming, too labor intensive. Uh, there's too much uh, risk. You know, there's not much fabrication of certainty with more risk. And so I've been trying to set up what the next step is. And I'm, the next step for me is, is just go back to Masons, trying to figure out how to cut and fold and create the more economically. And these are the two machines I bought to try that experiment again. And uh, this is a ton of respirator, which folds. And this is a plasma machine, which cuts. And uh, we're running on the scene. Uh, 